It's the same hustle, it's the same day. Same tears on the we play. Maybe one day we will see. We're one big family, like it's one channel. It's the same sunshine, it's the same rain. The same struggle, just to maintain. Maybe one day we will see. We're one big family, like it's one channel. Greetings and welcome to another episode of Discussions with Indigenous Education, the Genocide of the Dark Skin Indian. I'm your host, Tavis Sanders, also known as Red Tail Hawk. We'd like to welcome our co-host, Renee Sanders, also known as Red Silver Fox. Greetings, everyone. Uh, so let's do a quick review. Last episode, we went over the stages of genocide. And so let's list those stages for the viewing audience one more time. Okay. Well, they were classification, symbolization, discrimination, dehumanization, organization, polarization, preparation, persecution, extermination, and denial. <laughs> and that's a lot. <laughs> I mean, you know, so last episode we went over classification, right? And um, let me read classification, at least a uh, short, you know, the first sentence, right, mm -hmm. which states that, you know, classification groups are, are groups in position of power will categorize people according to their ethnicity, race, religion, or nationality, employing an us versus them mentality, which is really the important part of the classification aspect of genocide, right? And um, at you know we you know of course we always like to wrap up the previous show to give them some background on where we're going next, right? Mm -hmm. And um, just to wrap up last show, I want to take a quote out of a, a book by an author, right? And the book is called Another Country, right? And I think this book really wraps up classification, you know, from a genocide perspective really well. I'm going to read the quote directly. Okay, do, you mean uh, the, the quote itself? The not quote, necessarily the book. But not, yeah. No, the quote out of the book, <laughs> yeah. Another Country, yeah. <laughs> and it says, and I quote, By the late 18th century, planters simply categorized their Indian slaves as African, as part of the general trend to equate slavery with African ancestry, you know, and, and that really wraps up the idea of categorizing, right, and the genocide of a dark-skinned indigenous population through classification. Yes, and, you know, um, I think that sometimes when they say, when, when words like the 18th century are used or the 19th century, mm -hmm. that we really don't really think about exactly, because we hear 18th century, so we think 1800s. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. But we have to remember that when they're saying this by the late 18th century, that they're, they're talking about the late 1700s when the United States is just being formed. Right, <laughs> right, 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 you right. You know, so again, just perspective, you know, and again, words and how words are utilized. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Interesting, interesting. Yeah. And so again, the classification aspect of this and the employing the us versus me mentality is showcased really well in this particular quote. Yes. And that's why yes. we wanted to use it as a part of that. However, you know, it's other stages to <laughs> to discuss. Yes. And um, this show is going to be a very interesting show. Uh, we're actually going to combine two stages in today's show because of how much they just relate to each other, yes, right? Yes, yes. <laughs> and, and so, again, you know, we had, we talked about the 10 stages, we named them anyway, and the first stage was classification, and we're going to talk about the second stage today, which is symbolization, and we're also going to talk about the third stage, which is dehumanization, mm -hmm. right? And so let's Let's offer them the definition for symbolization as defined in the 10 stages of genocide. Okay. All right. And it says that symbolization refers to labeling the classified group. Okay. So labels. The groups dividing society are divided by a certain name, language, type of dress, uniform, or religious symbol. Mm. The symbolization of a certain ethnicity race or religion 
easily and visibly differentiates that group and the gap between the groups widen. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so they can, again, you know, using symbolization to uh, expand upon that us versus them mentality that, you know, was existing within the, the framework of the United States, right? Yeah, but the uh, thing is, though, is that these, these classifications, um, they're, they're human. You know, like even I mentioned in the last episode where I mentioned that, that Negro was not a derogatory terminology, mm -hmm. that it was just a terminology that was, that was a, uh, to define what the people looked like. To describe the people. To just describe them. So mm -hmm. it was, yeah, it was, it was just describing the people. And so, again, it, it wasn't a, a genocidal thing. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, so, so, no, so classification. all classifications and all symbolizations are not necessarily leading to the genocide. However, you know, as they state, and I'm going to read it again, mm -hmm. classification and dehumanization leads to genocide when um, it leads to de the next stage, which is dehumanization, right? And so... Okay, so classification and symbolization. And symbolization, excuse me. If used to dehumanize is now considered a genocidal practice. Okay, so let's read the definition of the dehumanization, dehumanization, which yes. is the third stage of genocide, okay. right? Yes, okay. okay. And as the word suggests is a process by which a particular group is marked as subhuman. This includes describing them as animals or disease. The process of dehumanization often involves negative propaganda campaigns. The process of dehumanization allows the government to violate the human rights of the targeted group without the widespread criticism of the country's people, just as long as the propaganda efforts are successful. Propaganda. <laughs> propaganda. And we're dealing with that still to this day, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, and so when categor uh, categorization, and classification rather, and symbolization are, are used as propaganda tools to widen the gap between groups, right, and cause this us versus me mentality or a superior versus inferior um, mindset, that's when it becomes stages of genocide and, and as, as sometimes, you know, genocidal practice within itself. Yes, and we know that propaganda <laughs> oh, oh man. Propaganda has been used so much so that yeah, it, it's hard to untangle everything. Mm -hmm. you, know? Uh, you know what? Interesting enough, we actually have a uh, short where we talk about propaganda. And so, you know, it's, this is actually right before the break. So it's a perfect time for us to take a break. We'll let them look at this video about propaganda so that they can have some more background information. And then when we get back, we'll start to share how symbolization was used to dehumanize the dark skin indigenous population or the uh, dark skin Indian here in the United States as a form of genocide. So we'll be right back with more discussions with indigenous education, the genocide of the dark skin Indian. Today's topic, 18th century propaganda and African slavery. Propaganda is information, ideas, or rumors deliberately spread widely to help or harm a person, group, movement, etc. A word that had just been introduced into the English vocabulary in the early 18th century, but by the end of the century, abolitionists were using this tactic widely as it provided results. At the end of the 18th century, slavery had become a very hot topic in politics here and abroad. While the newly forming United States depended on slavery to fund the colonies, abolitionist views were becoming more widespread and abolitionist subcultures began to emerge. One such group was the Society for Effecting the Abolition of the Slave Trade a British abolitionist group formed in May of 1787 in London, England. 
the society worked to educate the public about the abuses of the slave trade by writing and publishing anti-slavery books and pamphlets and creating abolitionist prints and posters. Their most infamous print is the image of the Brooks, an 18th century British slave ship. The Plymouth chapter of the Society for Effecting the Abolition of the Slave Trade acquired detailed measurements of the Brooks, including deck plans, cross sections, and side views. The abolitionists inserted images of prone black people to demonstrate the possibility of how they could be situated. It was a hypothetical illustration, an image that requires one to think what life is like when people are stored this way. It was an image that could carry its message into the minds of those who did not read the society's literature. Images had rarely been used as a propaganda tool in this way before. This image became one of the first political posters. This propaganda was so effective that it has lasted for centuries. It has sparked our imaginations to create images like this. It has also allowed our psyches to be so empathetic to African slavery that it clouds the fact that only 5% of the African slave trade actually took place on United States soil. You're watching Discussions with Indigenous Education. Greetings and welcome back to Discussions with Indigenous Education, the genocide of the Darskin Indian. Before the break, we went over the definition for symbolization and dehumanization um, with respect to the stages of genocide. We're going over stage two and stage three in today's show. And so let's start with the symbolization, right? It's, um, symbolization in itself isn't a genocidal practice, but when it's used to dehumanize, it is, right? And so um, let's talk about the symbolization of the in southeastern indigenous population, and let's really start from the beginning with Columbus, and 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 you know outline through history how symbolization was used to classify, categorize us. Okay. Well, um, now of course Columbus was on the islands. Yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. So he never made it to the mainland United States. Mm -hmm, <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. However, uh, the the practices that that they were practicing there uh, continued on to mainland United States, and so the the way that they were thinking about the indigenous people, well, the, when they when they did arrive to the mainland. They were still the indigenous people right. of, 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 <laughs> yeah, and of again, this part of the world. <laughs> and intent matters so much, yes. right? And again, we talked about it, the intent matters as a part of article um, convention. So, um, and yeah. looking at what Columbus stated and the things that he did offers us intent, the, the intent that they have. Yes, because Columbus, before he arrived here, he was a slaver already, mm. you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so he was already trading and picking up slaves from, from Africa, as a matter of fact, and bringing them back up into Portugal mm -hmm. to be part of the uh, Mediterranean slave trade. And so that was something that he was quite familiar with, the slaving part of, of selling people. Mm. Okay. Mm. okay. So uh. when he got here, as a matter of fact, there was a statement that was in a book that said that Columbus knew that there would be a demand for slaves to work the mines to perform menial labor and cultivate the plantations, and with an eye to the future, he proclaimed the people just what he desired them to be. Okay? Mm. And so now, what did he desire them to be? Well, he needed them to be slaves. Mm -hmm. he, okay? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so what do you do? You have your propaganda campaign. <laughs> <laughs> right, okay. 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 All right. And so uh, one of the statements, is, uh, it says that it served to humor Columbus at the time to declare these newly discovered people cannibals. Mm, mm. So when he got to the islands, um, he, he, he really thought that he was landing in India or, <laughs> okay, and he ran into Indians, okay. But he also thought that he was going to run into the Great Khan, okay, and the Great Khan was uh, a cannibal. Okay. And so as he was traveling around the islands, he kept hearing about the Catarid people, okay, 
which he referred to as caniba, which was a terminology in Spanish mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. was talking about cannibals. cannibals. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so he kept hearing these stories about these Caribs that were being a little disruptive to the islands. And so Columbus says, oh, okay, they have to be cons people. And so they have to be cannibals. And if you're a cannibal, then you're worthy of subjugation because your is a form of dehumanization. Yes. As a matter of fact, I have another statement, and, and these are all coming out of a particular book. We will put the book up that, uh, that okay. we're taking these statements mm -hmm, from, okay? Mm -hmm. But this statement says, it was far easier to declare the weak and inoffensive natives of that island infected with, infected, I'm sorry, with the taint of cannibalism and thus subject to the imposition of slavery. Okay, and here we go again with this slavery, Indian slavery uh, issue that was almost erased from history, right? <laughs> and how that classification of slave, you know, again, was used to strip away histories, identities, and, um, you know, uh, s s cultures, right? Yeah, but you know, it's interesting though that, that, that a lot of times, you know, we, we hear that, that they use the people as slaves, but we didn't hear why they started doing that. Mm -hmm. You know, and mm -hmm. it's like, oh, okay, they declare them as cannibals, and so if they're cannibals, then, then they must we, can, be we can make them a slave because they're not human. Right, right, and so that's where classification and symbolization can lead or does lead to the dehumanization of our our people as an indigenous population mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and and we also know though that um with this next statement that we're really about to cover about how that these classifications just got kind of murky <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or it is really the beginnings of how how well really i think the, when the statement that we will be reading which was written in an 1890s uh, book, the uh, United States book, mm -hmm. okay, mm -hmm. but it was referring all the way back to the 1500s. Mm -hmm. And so again, that, and as I read this statement, uh, we will see how they changed mm -hmm. uh, this Terms. classification mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. so that it would be able to fit their history. The history that they want to propagate. Yes, and so the statement says, Diayan, who was a, um, Ex, uh, a, conquistador, a conquistador, an explorer, yes. <laughs> andelantado, a military soldier. Yes, he was, he was given permission by Spain to, to, to make conquests and to mm -hmm. do things, okay? Mm -hmm. So, he persisted in slave hunting about Beaufort, 1520. These Negroes being valuable as laborers while the Indians were worthless. <laughs> Okay, now, yeah, this is, this is interesting because, again, this says 1520. So this is only a few years after Ponce de Leon discovered mainland United States. Mm -hmm, okay, mm -hmm. and... They, they weren't shipping anyone here yet. No, they, they've only been to, to mainland, mainland. Two, two, three times tops? <laughs> two, uh, two times. I think uh, Ponce de was about to do his third one, which was the year before this. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so he's only been to the mainland twice, mm -hmm, you know. Mm -hmm. So where these Negroes come from? Yeah, and, and again, and, and why were Indians worthless? And, and it wouldn't the whole population be Indian? Yes, and so that would mean that all the Indians were worthless, and so if they were worthless, why would, you know, then why you're making them a slave if they're worthless? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Or, yeah, so, yeah. And, and again, and how would this change to you know why would they use this is because again as far as history is concerned there were no dark-skinned indigenous populations here in the united states so if you have any tint to you right if you have any melanin in your skin you must be from africa the the problem is is that it's 1520 right and you haven't bought any africans here yet and so and what is also interesting with this here in particular is that when they landed around Beaufort, South Carolina, so mm -hmm. it, it was around Beaufort, that they captured or they tricked, they mm -hmm. said about 60 people, they tricked on to board of their, on board a ship, and they shipped them to the islands and uh, used them as slaves. Now what is interesting is that 
in some books, they will say that they were Africans that were brought over, the first Africans that were brought over from the mainland to be used as, as slaves. But it's like, yeah, but they, they were the indigenous people. From the United States, from, not yes. from Africa. Yes. You know, so again, you know, this is where their history conflicts with facts, right? Mm -hmm. And while we're asking the population in general to offer us the opportunity to share omitted facts with respects to American history in general, so that you can better understand us and, and you know, respect us for who we are and what we're trying to, to, to revitalize our history. No one else gonna do it for us, right? <laughs> now, again, we're talking about symbolization. And it's so many, if, if your mind is even considering how many references that we can make to the symbolization of a uh, dark-skinned Indian, um, in <laughs> yeah, and, and, yes, in the dehumanization <laughs> of any dark-skinned person, you know, in, in the United States. Um, let's talk about, the, uh, let's, let's offer some perspectives. You know, let's move into the 1600s. And let's talk about some laws or some events that occurred that led to, you know, this dehumanization of specific groups through symbolization, right? Mm -hmm. Well, by the time we get into the 1600s, you know, the, the, the British are here, the French are here, <laughs> everybody's here <laughs> trying to, to mark their space. <laughs> and uh, so by the by the mid to late 1600s, uh, many people from England now have moved into Virginia. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. So it's a, um, I, I forget exactly how many people moved, but it was, it was a substantial amount of the population of Britain that moved <laughs> into uh, Virginia. Virginia at the time. Okay. Or uh, like I said, around the, the late 1600s, 1670, around that time. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. But, um, most of these, uh, well, many of the people that came over, of course, you know, they're coming over by ships, and so they had to pay their way. Mm -hmm. Many people could not pay their way, and so they were hired as indentured servants. Uh, so uh, if you became an indentured servant, your, your way got paid, but you had to devote seven years of your life to... Um, to servitude. To ser yes, for servitude, mm -hmm. and after seven years, you were given your freedom, uh, a lot of times they gave you uh, a, a gun or they gave you some other things and then that was that was it. You were supposed to receive land, mm -hmm. but many of them did not. Okay, and so now we have a large group of ex-slaves that own guns <laughs> and no land. <laughs> yes. Sounds okay. like a perfect, sounds perfect. <laughs> okay, now, yes, and, uh, but now again, let's, Remember, when we're saying slave here at this time, mm -hmm. we're talking about the white servitude, <laughs> the indentured servitude, you know. Mm -hmm. Okay, right. So that, so that a lot, you know, because again, when we hear the term slave, a lot of times our minds just go to dark skin. <laughs> okay, yeah, we're, but we're not talking about, we're talking about indentured white slaves that arrived here for uh, the American dream. Mm -hmm. You know, it's so much so, they wanted it so much so that they put themselves into slavery for seven years. Now that seven years is over, they get a few trinkets, a gun, a few things, no land. No land. And now we have this large uh, population. And yes, they said it was about one fourth of the population of Virginia at that time. Virginia's population was about 36,000 people. So 9,000 people, and again, we're talking about 9,000 white ex-endangered servants with guns <laughs> with guns that don't have any property the only people that they can go to are the elites what they call the elites mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. we're, we're familiar with that terminology of course uh, <laughs> okay and um and they were starting to get angry Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. because yeah, they they had to go to them for everything. You know, if they wanted to buy supplies, they would go to the elites. Okay, uh, if they wanted yeah food, they wanted to buy. Uh, and then if they didn't want to deal with the elites, the only thing that they could do is to go to the perimeters of society. And if they're on the perimeters of society, they got to deal with the indigenous people. Right, because they're infringing on uh, in your natives' lands, right? Yes. That was a big problem at that time. Oh boy, was it? Yes. Okay, so 
you know, we're giving you uh, some background information on, um, you know, Baker's Rebellion and, you know, some of the, the reasoning behind this rebellion taken into effect. Yeah, because that rebellion took place in uh, 1676. Mm -hmm. and, um, and again, the, the, this white impoverished society was upset. And they, now again, remember, they were indentured servants. And so they, what they did is that they gathered all of these indentured servants. At this time, some of them could have been Africans. Some of them could have been Indians. Mm -hmm. And so you had this hodgepodge of people that were fighting against the United States government. They burned down Jamestown. Mm -hmm. They started making up new laws. <laughs> and of course, the elite were not that you know they could not stand for this for very much longer again because now you have their their own white brethren fighting against them right and um you know we had to take a break here but to um wrap this aspect of the show up and so now now that this event has taken place the burning of jamestown right the capital they even went so far to start creating their own laws, oh, yes. right? The, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and now the elite, they take back control after Baker's, you know, he died. He passes away not too long after the rebellion. A lot of his laws actually stay on the book. A lot of the developing laws that they put into place, which had to do with slavery of the indigenous population, mm -hmm. the elites, you know, the governing system, once they took back over Jamestown, left those laws into place, right? And not only that, but now we have a concept that grows from this rebellion, which is the, we cannot have white slaves living next to black slaves. And so we're going to come up with this concept of race to differentiate the groups. And now we can see, we can see our slaves. We, because now if you're dark skin, you're a slave. And if you're not dark skin, you're not a slave. And, you know, and then start to use propaganda to breed that hatred and disdain for anyone that doesn't look like you. Right now. So so the the evolution and development of race is just a little bit of what they got if they interested in looking at the Baker's Rebellion and then watch how race was developed from that time on as a classifying um, opportunity for the system, right? And then the symbols that now come out of this, uh, this new dynamic of black slaves and, and, and white citizenry, you know, for I guess that's the easiest way for me to say that. <laughs> um, and so when we get back we'll see how this symbolization and this classification of these people, you know, led to laws that were dehumanizing um, to us as a dark-skinned um, Indian population, right? And so we'll be right back with more discussions with indigenous education, the genocide of the dark-skinned Indian. You're watching discussions with indigenous education on Philly Camp.